Behind every successful endeavor in life is a relationship built on trust. Welcome to The Trust Doctor, restoring trust and enriching significant relationships, a podcast focused on helping you nurture healthy relationships. Join thought leader and world-renowned expert on relationship and empowerment coaching, Dr. Patty Ann, and her special guests every week for insightful and meaningful conversations filled with great takeaways that will help you build healthier business partnerships and happier romantic relationships. Are you ready to restore trust and enrich the significant relationships in your life? The Trust Doctor, Dr. Patty Ann, is in. Welcome to today's podcast episode of The Trust Doctor, Restoring Trust and Enriching Significant Relationships. And I have an interview in store for you today that is going to blow you away. But before we go any further, make sure you like, share, comment, and subscribe to this podcast. So today's guest personifies the concept of redemption. He is someone that went from prison to Harvard. Yes, you heard that right. Prison to Harvard. So let me not hold you in suspense any longer, but I would suggest that you buckle up because Andre Norman is about to take us for a ride. Welcome, Andre, and thank you so much for being a guest on today's podcast. It is so happy to be here. I was not going to miss it for the world. I've been strapped in this chair. (laughs) (laughs) I strapped myself to the chair. I said, I have to do this. My last call, he was trying to go. No, 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 no. I got to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I know that you will legally hold everybody hostage for however amount of generous time you're about to share. So, Andre, I didn't go into all your bio stuff because people I know are going to be looking you up after the interview. Don't leave us yet. So, please share with us your incredible story. And I'll get everybody to talk about your book later ambassador of hope, but you are a miracle in the flesh. So please share with us what you would like our listeners to know. I grew up in the city of Boston, um, born in the city. My condolences. No, just joking. No, I feel bad for you New Yorkers. (laughs) See, we're already getting at it here. I mean, listen, the Yankees were nothing until we gifted you Babe Ruth. Oh, the Yankees good. were nothing Lord. if we gifted you Roger Clemens and Wade Boggs. The I think Yankees we call that nothing. excuses. Go ahead. Keep going. Nothing no until what? Garbage team before we put you on the map. How many rings? How many How many championships? How many rings? How many I rest my. I rest my case. All okay. right. Okay. Oh, Back I to Boston, that. which is actually, I tease people, but it's, an, it's really a fun, great sports town. Of course, everything's right there. But I um, grew up in the city. Um, mom had six kids, single. Um, it was really tough trying to manage six kids, and I had high energy. And now, what was, number were you in the on the kid list? Number five. Number five. So you're yeah. in the bottom. Second to the bottom. I got a little brother. So, okay. I mean, it was just tough. And then you get off track. And you figure out that you're poor, so you start going to to the park to hustle after school to make a couple of hours. I used to make thirty bucks a day in the park just so I could buy clothes and buy- But we are hustling. I used to help the older kids sell weed. So the other kids would sell weed. I was little. So I used to run across the street and get like four, I mean, a, a little box with weed and then bring it back. I so you were the go between, you were the broker. No, 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 I was the runner. Oh, you, <laughs> okay. I'm 11, I'm not a broker. <laughs> but, um, basically, I mean, I started doing that so I can support myself. Then I started playing the trumpet in the sixth grade. And by the ninth grade, I was really good at it. And I'm going to band every day in high school. And my kids, my friends convinced me to give it up. I they saw the it. trumpet in the background. For the for the people that are listening, uh, Andre has a trumpet in the background. And I wasn't sure why that was there. So you started when you were six. So first grade, I guess school had a program. Yeah, school did. Six, middle school had a sixth grade. They oh, started, sixth, grade. sixth grade started the band. I was in it. 
And by high school, I was really good at it. And I'm in the band in high school and love playing the trumpet. And then my friends convinced me it was stupid. It wasn't cool. Black folks didn't do that. So I gave up my trumpet. I gave up my trumpet. I gave up my dream. And I just drifted all the way through high school, getting in trouble. I ended up in court and they sent me to state prison. I got to state prison. I started for six years running around, getting in trouble, fighting every day, getting in trouble. In prison, while you're in, in prison. prison. Okay. Yes. Prisons is a place you put a bunch of people who are disgruntled, unhappy, and addicted to something, stick them in one big place and close the door. Yeah, well, good things are about fight. to happen. Yeah, that great sounds thing. like a, a great formula. Yeah. So I wake up one day in solitary confinement. I've been in there for two and a half years, and I realized- Wait, something. wait, solitary confinement for two years? Two and a half. Two and a half. Wait- how does that, how, I mean, I know what it means, but how does that work? And what the heck did you do? If you commit a crime in prison, they can't send you to prison because you're already there. <laughs> you're already there. So they send you to solitary confinement. So I was charged. No matter what the crime is, like you stole somebody's, I don't know. Serious crime. Hello. Serious crimes. So I had two attempted murders. You attempted the murder or the murder? Yes. Was... No, no. I attempted murder other people. What? While I was in prison. What? What happened? So it's a lifestyle. This is what you do. It's like, you ask a guy at the bar, why does he drink? That's what he does. Hmm. Why do you get two drinks? Uh, five drinks, 10 drinks. It's like, I'm at the bar. At the bar, you drink, and in prison, there's a lot of violence. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, you're just saying it, like, as a matter of fact, but that's really heavy when you think about it, right? Oh, no, I mean, prison is not a fun place. There's a lot of bad, you have the most violent people in the country stuffed into one building and left to their own devices. All right. So, two attempted, so, so, so not to be uh, sarcastic, but after the first attempted murder, ha- if you were in solitary confinement, how but it happened you- the same day. I tried to kill multiple oh, people. Excuse, I didn't even silly me. <laughs> it's the morning and the afternoon. Of course. It was the same time. It was like, it was, it was a wow. fight and Oh, so okay, a bunch of them, okay. a bunch of us, and it just because there's bad. a whole subculture going on in the prison, right? And if oh, you're no. not in a gang, you're you're dead, I guess. You're a victim. You're a victim. You're... Hmm. Okay. You'll wow. be robbed, raped, extorted, something most likely. Okay. okay. But I'm sitting in solitary confinement, and I realize something. I'm the king of nowhere. That um, this whole life is make believe, is stupid. So I decided I wanted to go home and be successful. So I said, I'm going to go home and be successful. So I figured I'd go to college. So I picked a school called Harvard University. I came out my cell the next day. I got my gang together. I told them, I'm going home, going to Harvard. And they told me, no, Dre, you can't do that. And they started telling me all the reasons I couldn't go to Harvard. I'm blind. Did they laugh, at, did they laugh in your face? No, I stab people for a living. Nobody laughs at me. <laughs> I stab people for a living. Of course. Okay. Well, actually, that guy. So they just told me, when they were telling me why I couldn't go to Harvard, I didn't even hear them, but I heard when my friends in the ninth grade who stole my trumpet. Because I had a dream once and my friends talked me out of it. Oh, so you never again. really let go of that dream as much as you were talked out of it. Yeah, I mean, I let it go, but I realized it was a bad decision. Mm. So here we are now, I'm about to make another bad decision because my friends think it's stupid. So I, I let them go. And the, the worst part about it was I could have came out my cell and said, hey, we're going to go attack the other gang. We're going to stab them all. They said, yeah, and ran with me. Hey, we're going to go fight the guards. They said, yeah, and they ran with me. I said, let's go home and be successful. Everybody said no. You said you're in prison, right? How many years were you serving at this point? 28. 28. I had a 100-year sentence, but I was supposed to do 28. Okay. And you had how many years left in the 28? I was Because you're not getting out on good behavior, right? I I I had six years in and a bunch more to go. Okay, a bunch more to go. All right. So you're in solitary confinement, and I would imagine many times when somebody's in solitary confinement, they're the victim, they're angry, they're pissed off, they're going to get like, they're not thinking like lollipops and rainbows. No. How, how what, what, like, take us into your mindset where you had that shift of, because, because pe- you might save many people's lives with this answer. What was the shift in prison, um, you know, n- not with the best of society, to be an understatement, and all of a sudden you had a mind? Like, what, what was going on in your mind? I was in solitary for trying to kill eight people. 
And the day before, I had this concept of trying to attack some more people. And the thing in prison is every day you got to fight. You got to fight. You got to. That's just how you live and how you make your name. And when I wanted to attack these people, that's when I came to realize that I was the king of nowhere. That I'm about to become the king of this whole place. I'm about to become the number one ranking gang member in the state. But what does it all really mean? Nothing. And it just—it's like the Wizard of Oz. If you've seen the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy comes. She gets her team. She marches through the whole place of Oz. She gets to the end. She pulls the curtain back, and this old guy pulling levers. It's all fake. Right. That's how I felt. And the crazy thing about The Wizard of Oz, nobody cared that the wizard was fake. Right. Watch the movie. Nobody cared. And it wasn't until Dorothy pulled the curtain back, her and Toto, did they find out, and the world still didn't care. They were, they were cool to have some fake guy pulling levers because people live in little, little sub-worlds that they've created and they don't care about the logic world that they're part of. And when I saw the world for what it was to be fake, and now I'm like, it was my job to sit in that chair and be the wizard. And I saw, I don't want to do that. That's stupid. I'm a rational person. So I said, I don't want to stay here if that's what this is all is. Mm-hmm. And the crazy thing is I committed my life to this madness. So now I had to make a full turn. I went back and I said, first I said, I want to be free. And I realized free doesn't work because 75% of people get free, come back to prison. 75%, that's the recidivism rate? Yes. Wow. They'll tell you why a lot of wonderful numbers. Every state would tell you they have wonderful numbers. 75% of people go back. And then I realized, I don't want, who doesn't come to jail? I said, successful people don't come to jail, so I want to be that. Free is the parking lot. I don't want to be in the parking lot. I want to be successful. I want a big house, I want a nice car. Free, free is the parking lot. You want to be successful. It's awesome. I love that. I love that. So I worked for the next eight years, 20 hours a day, taught myself how to read, taught myself the law, went to anger management, went to groups, went to counseling, went to self-help groups. And I overturned my case on appeal. I went to every program that wasn't nailed down. And when I came home, I had a goal. Hey, before you get out, before you let yourself out, you tell your, your gang members, right? You're the king of no- nothing, but to them, it's still something that you want to go to Harvard. How did you not... How did you survive, survive that within the prison and the, your gang? Because I would imagine you were now outed. You were not well, you know, outed because I was always a good friend. So, ah, you to right so now. we're going back to relationships and trust. I love that. I knew you were so going to get there. Is, when I was on my way up the ladder, as you would call it, I was a fair guy. I was a decent guy. I was a psychopath, but I was a fair psychopath. <laughs> And I never bullied people. I hated bullies. I used to be really short as a kid. And I treated everybody with respect. And if I ever had a battle with you, it was because you had it coming. It wasn't that I just randomly picked you out of the crowd. So when I decided that I didn't want to be that guy anymore, it was 20,000 people wanting to be the boss of the prison. I let them have it. I became the advisor to the guy that replaced me. So you were trusted. You were a trusted advisor. Brilliant. And aside from being a trusted advisor, one guy came at me one time like, Dre, why you keep going to the program? What's really going on? And I was like, I'm trying to get my life together, man. My, my mind's messed up. My life is messed up. They said, you're the smartest guy here. You don't have problems. What are you really doing over there? And he's challenging my integrity. I said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to counseling them all. I got two options. I can either go in and talk about me and my dad and how we don't get along, and it upsets me. I can go to you and get my knife, come back and stab me in the face and talk about how this guy tried to get in my way of going to counseling. <laughs> you pick it. But I'm going. And he looked at me. He's like, OK, I just poked the bed and I'm about to get my head chopped off. I'm like, right. dude, if I got to chop your head off to go to counseling, then so be it. I prefer not to. But if that's what you want, then I'll chop your head off and go to counseling and talk about that. But I'm going to counseling either way. And he was like, yo, Dre, you need to go talk about your dad, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. To get... And then he, he pulled up on me later and he said, if you figure out. What really bothered you with your dad? Let me know, because I got the same problem. There were so many people in jail who have issues with their parents. There are so many people on drugs who have issues with their parents. There are so many people who are suicidal and depressed that have issues with their parents. There are so many people in horrible relationships who have issues with their parents that are unresolved. So prison is a relative term. There's a lot of people who've been married for 14 years that are in prison. There are people who have crazy, wonderful uh, jobs that are in prison. People who have lives. I look at Prince and Michael Jackson. They had the greatest lives ever in prison. Anthony yeah. Bourdain, prison. Kate Spade, prison. You go down the list of people that we think have great lives. 
from the outside. Prison isn't a penitentiary. Prison is a state of mind that you're locked in. And so many people are locked in this downward cycle and spiral that they don't know how to get out. So they were, oh, just, just the guys in the prison. No, there are people right now living in Hollywood or living in Scottsdale or living in New York who are stressed out and their life sucks, according to them. So some, right. Well, everything is relative, right? So there's just two things. One is sometimes people are in a prison of their own making because they have chosen to become a victim, right? They are the victim, what's being done to them, personified, say, with their parents. Their parents suck. That's why everything's my fault. But I do have to stop for a moment because when you mentioned Kate Spade and now you're talking about depression, that's not necessarily somebody that's a victim. So I feel like we just have to be no. careful here. No, I'm not talking about people being victims. She had a lifestyle that she couldn't get out of. She, she, she what was she depressed. had was treatable. Can we, oh, what what okay. she had was treatable. She oh, that's true. She help. wouldn't go. But you know what? You're right. to, no, no. She didn't know how to access help. Right. What she had was treatable. I mean, she did not, Anthony Bourdain did not need to die. What he had was treatable. He couldn't see the help. Got it. Got it. So it's not that it was, I'm not blaming him. He's where he's supposed to be in the sense of he's stuck. The people around him couldn't connect to him. And he couldn't connect to the outer resources. Same thing with Kate Spade. She's not a victim. It, or seeing she, because of parents, Whatever her reason for being in that hole, she couldn't see her way out. She couldn't get out. Yeah. So yeah. so let's let's bring that to you then, because you have made lending your hand, having somebody be able to reach out. Right. Many people have hands extended to them and they can't accept it. They can't grab it. So let's talk about what makes you so special. It's not just. It's not just Andre that you got out of prison, but but you have saved so many lives because of your gift of turning your life around. But what's what is the magic that you bring where you can help save people and talk about who you save and how you do it? It really is incredible. The, the magic is I know their pain, if not their specific pain, I know the pain. So. I have experienced trauma, torture, depression, loss, grief at extreme levels. And I'm in a situation where I never thought I'd ever, ever, ever come out. I'm locked in the basement of prison with shackles on my feet. My life is over. And I had to find that thing in me to lift myself out. So when I run into a person who's depressed or suicidal or addicted, I, they can look at me and be like, he gets it. They, they connect. He gets it. Mm -hmm. He's been to a deeper, darker place than where I am right now. And being in the basement of a prison, locked in a cell with no sunlight for two and a half years is really, really dark place. And I lived down there for a long time. And I, even though I came out of there, I had that mindset. So when I sit with somebody in trauma, I don't blame them. I don't judge them. Don't even try to understand them. I just sit with them. I'm going to embrace you and accept whatever you say the world is. If you say the world is this, it's awful, it's not worth living, then you know something I agree. The world is not worth living. But let's give me, explain it to me. Mm -hmm. I don't go against them. Oh, you need to live. No, no, the world sucks. You want to, ah, listen, I get that. I've been there. Explain to me why you think the world sucks and you should want to die. And the more they talk, the more you can hear them. You have to hear them. It's not a directive. It's not a mandate. It's not a speech. You have to hear their pain then speak to their pain. You can't speak to their symptoms. You have to speak to their pain. Drugs Give an example of that. Give an example of that. Because I know you okay. do that. Somebody's depressed and they're drinking a lot. And they want to talk to the person about drinking. Oh, man, you shouldn't drink as much. I was talking to somebody yesterday. And they were like, hey, man, I'm, I'm off track. I'm, going, I'm drinking too much. I'm going down the wrong way. I'm like, well, what are you doing with your life? They said nothing. I said, well, if you're doing nothing, you should be drinking a lot. <laughs> which is the opposite of what he's expecting. Yeah, if you're just sitting around doing nothing, yeah, drinking a lot comes with that. Right. Then I said, okay, well, let's work on not the drinking, but the doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Let's not work on the addictions. Let's work on the causality for the addiction. Mm -hmm. So why do you feel that you need to escape? I don't care where you're running to. 
because I can take all the drugs, I can take all the alcohol, I can take all the bad relationships away. Denied access is not treatment. If I take you and lock you in the basement right now, I let you out in five years. If you smoke cigarettes, you're going to smoke again. If you drink alcohol, you're going to drink again. If you got bad relationships, you're going to find another one. So denied access is not treatment. That's why a lot of drug rehabs don't work because they just take you to the mountains. They lock you in a cabin. You can't get access to drugs, but they don't treat the underlying symptoms. The why. Once you remove the why, the what changes. So how do you how do you help someone come to that place of all right? We and it's the thing about drinking that's amazing is you know people drink they're depressed they drink well alcohol is a depressant so initially it might make you feel better but then shortly thereafter you feel worse it's like well I drink to go to sleep well it will put you to sleep but it won't keep you asleep and you don't right. get it to sleep so how do you so somebody tells you I have nothing going on in my life my parents suck. The world is terrible. Everything's stacked against me. So I drink. I'm like, that makes sense. I'd agree with you. hundred percent. That is a great reason to be drinking. Right. And it then. It makes perfect sense to me why you're drinking. They say you can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. And that's wrong. There's just a mm-hmm. step before that, getting them ready to want help. And that's why I come in. So okay, I so embrace talk about your that. space. I yeah. embrace your space. Don't judge it. Don't shame it. Don't challenge it. I embrace your space. If I can get you to let me into your space, now there's two. Now there's positivity in your space, where before you were alone, and you was it was only darkness. If I can convince you to let me in your space, now there's light in your space. I don't try to pull you out. I just try to bring light in. And so, so you often, basically join. You join with them, and you start yeah. that process. Quite frankly, of creating trust. Yes. Judgment free zone. We, we come in. Most people who are suicidal, depressed or addicted feel alone. Mm. So if you allow me to your space, guess what? You're not alone. Right. But then when you leave, like you make somebody feel better. And at that moment, I can I can feel that, as you said that, because you're right. It is such a horrible to, to act to feel alone in the world is not being sarcastic is, is incredibly lonely. Like, yeah. like as humans, we are wired to be connected, right? That's one of the reasons why COVID, no politics involved, but COVID was so difficult. People were alone. They were, lo- they were losing that connection. Right. So, so you create that connection with them, but then you can't stay with them. But you don't, so have, to, you don't have to stay physically to be connected. So do you love me less because I'm on Zoom? No. Exactly. <laughs> so you get into their into their minds and hearts. Yeah. There you go. If you're looking forward to seeing me again. There was a I am, but, but but we could argue whether I'm crazy or not, too. I mean but, yeah, but we're all crazy. There's right. a gentleman I work with. He was I was at a conference, the aunt came to me, so my nephew's gonna kill himself. Oh. I got him on the phone, I talked him off the ledge, and I said, I'm gonna come see him. We agreed that me coming to see him will be phenomenal. And then we're going to do this big speech at his college. Guess what it gave him? Something to look forward to. Hope. Hope. And when I showed up at his college a few weeks ago, we did the presentation. I said, this is going to be even better next year. So he has a whole year to plan. He has something to plan. When people start giving up, they start letting go of things. Right. So you gave him a reason, a reason, a reason to go forward. Yes. He looked forward to the first event. Now he's looking forward to the second event and it gives him purpose. That's his So why, why do all these programs, there are such a ridiculous amount of money spent on programs that don't work. Why? Unfortunately, people monopolize and, and monetize your pain and suffering. So that's horrible. That's just, that's, that feels horrible. That's what it is. So for me, I'll equate it to Black Lives Matter. When George oh Floyd died, the whole world called my phone. Or every white friend I had called me, hey, Dre, hey, Dre. Oh, wait a minute, Dre. I didn't call you. I Was I supposed to call you? You're from New York. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a lot of people calling me who were in turmoil and unease, unrest about how did they navigate this. And I'm having this phone call. And I'm telling my friends, my black friends, we've waited 400 years for the phone to ring pick up the phone. 
Don't try to shame them or beat them down or lower this over their head because they're trying to ask for help now. Where you've been it's been 400 years. You should have been asked. No, help people be better and helps it all be better. So when people go to treatment, there's two things you can do. You can find a way to make it work. You can find a way to make it not work. And a lot of treatment centers are looking to exploit. There are people in the Black Lives Matter movement who are looking to exploit. There are people in the drug treatment center who are looking to exploit. There are people in every venture that are sure. looking to exploit, and there's people looking to do better. I can tell you there are good correctional guards. I can tell you there are good police officers. I can tell you there are good white and black people. And that same token is the opposite on the of other end. Of course. Of course. In this place, for some people, it becomes a thing about money and money over people. So I literally just flew to San Francisco like 18, it was like 12 hours just to go encourage some moms. I got like to encourage some moms who are dealing with suicide with their kids and stressed out. And we save one life. We save two lives. We save three lives. You got to show up and it can't be about the money. You got to be about the people. So, you know, they say if you want to save the world, you save one life. Yep. Right. And that's what we do. All right. That, that it's, it's look, I'm no Pollyannish here, but it's so disheartening to think, you know, people are in so much pain, so much turmoil, and somebody just looks at the dollars. That just that's that's absolutely mind blowing. All right. So so how many years? Let's go back a little bit. So how many years you're in prison, you're turning it around, you're going to every program not nailed down. Um, and then how many years? From I do some nailed down ones. I pulled the boards up. <laughs> I pulled the boards up. And I'm getting that one, too. <laughs> Ain't no stopping you. So so how many years it take? does it take you to get out? Eight more years from the time I turned it around. I mean, and then you what? You enroll in Harvard? Like you go to the Crimson, you're like, or oh, whatever they are. I'm here. Crimson Tide. Crimson, I came home. Oh, Crimson Tide's Alabama. That's why I Crimson, stopped myself. No, no. Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide. Yeah, the sister okay. Crimson. Just Crimson, right? Under Charles, right? Crimson. Under roll, Charles. Right. Roll, roll Alabama. Came home. Roll tide. Yeah. This is the thing. The, the law of manifestation and attraction works. Mm -hmm. I came home. I ended up at an agency where the entire staff had come from Harvard. Harvard. Listen to him. He even uh, says Harvard now. I'm from Boston. I'm not faking. Uh, I forgot. Harvard. Okay. So they started taking me to Harvard early. I'm out of jail six months and I'm on the campus doing lectures, doing seminars and just hanging out with my people because that's where they came from. My wife has a degree from Harvard and we're there all the time. She, I met her. She was one of the people I first met in this group. So we're on the campus and I'm in the what, what is this group? What was this group? There was, a, there, was a there was a Christian group of students in the Ivy League. And when they graduated from college, there was like 40 of them. They said, what are we going to do with our faith? Are we going to go work for the companies? We're going to go work for God. So you had these 40 PhD students move from Harvard, Dartmouth, Yale, Princeton, into the city and start a nonprofit and start a church. So when I came home, I ended up by chance meeting these folks and joining their nonprofit. So but you were that because you were a member of their church? I ended up a member of the church, but I met him through the nonprofit first. Got it. And I came into the nonprofit as these 40 PhDs and these geniuses. And I'm hanging out with them every day. And it's, you are who your circle is. And they made the connection for me, the leverage over. Then the work I was doing in Ferguson, Missouri, around the protest in 2016, got mm -hmm. me a fellowship to Harvard Law School. They called me and said they wanted to partner with me. And... Dr. Charles Ogletree, who raised up Michelle and Barack Obama, became my mentor slash boss. Mm -hmm. And I came to Harvard Law School in his department as a fellow. And what, what was the fellowship on? What was the subject matter? Doing community engagement. Okay. So the work I was doing in social justice around Ferguson, work I was doing in community, communities around the world, from Honduras to Guatemala to Sweden to West Africa. I mean, they just liked the work I was doing, and they wanted to partner. Okay, so how long is the program that you're in for a fellowship? A year or two? It, it was like two years. I, it was no really time frame, but um, when Dr. Elbertree got sick, he step, had to step down, and I was there with him. So when he goes, that's like if Joe Lee's genius. Who's am I staying? Nah, I don't know. We're talking for the listeners that don't know. So Andre and I met through Genius Network through Joe Polish, the 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 incomparable start founder of. 
Joe Polish, between Joe, between Joe and Andre, I think I, I don't know how many millions of lives you guys have saved, right? Those That's are the, the people, goal. those are the people you want to keep company with for sure. Definitely. So if he left there, I'd probably go with him. So you're not you won't stay if I stay? I'd come visit. <laughs> Touche for you, Andre. Two, well, I'm going with Joe too, so I'm with you. We're all going together. We'll all right, so you time. leave, you leave, and h- how do you get, you started the Academy of Hope, uh, you, you, you're you literally an international figure, so how did you build up, all from such a place of appreciation, gratitude, giving back? Sh- I just started helping people, that's it, I just showed up with no expectation, helping people, showing up, no expectation, helping people, and then other people started seeing me, I got international, I'm working in the city. And there was a guy from London Business School, Jules Gothard. He saw me. He said, if he can do this with gang members and prostitutes, what can he do with businessmen? And they <laughs> flew me to London. And they put me in a room with Deutsche Bank and said, we don't know how this is going to go, but do your thing. And <laughs> I've been working for London Business School with London Business School since 20, 2001. Eric Simo with British Petroleum, London's Construction. Thieves with three-piece suits on. Oops. Yeah. Hey, listen, I can go all along with that. <laughs> They used to throw me in dorms and I throw me in conference rooms. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I just started that. And then when I came to Phoenix, I didn't meet Joe. There was a guy named Mike Burnoff called me. And me and Mike, Mike called me to tell me he couldn't meet me. Because we were supposed to meet. And my friend tried to introduce us. He called me to tell me he couldn't meet. I said, is anybody I could help? He says, what do you do? I said, I do interventions. He said, my wife's best friend. So I went out to go help that kid. And once he saw me do that, then he introduced me to Joe. So when he called me, no expectation, never heard Joe's polished name. I just said, hey, can I help somebody? You can't meet, but can I help somebody? Me offering to help led me to Genius Network. Well, you know, those are the magic words for Joe. How may I help, right? Yeah. And how many years ago was that, Andre? That was four years ago now. Wow. I feel like, I feel like you're an institution. It seems like you've been involved forever. <laughs> right? Because you're going around the world. You go around. Oh, yeah. So people call me. I've been to over 24 countries. When Honduras had the highest murder rate, they called me. When Sweden had problems with drug addiction, they called me. When Liberia had child soldiers in the street post Civil War, we went. And same thing in America. We go to Scottsdale, to Helena, Montana, to Salt Lake City, to Compton, to Miami Beach. Wherever there's a problem, if there's somebody in pain or need, they call, we show up. Okay. So I, I, I know. You've been so generous with your time. Do you have just a couple more minutes? For you, I'm going to be late for my next call. There you go. Okay. So I do want to respect your time because you are doing unbelievable work that the world needs. So I do want, I will ask how people can find out more about you, but I do want to know what, what is next for you? What's what, next? What's on, for the, me? what's on the horizon for Andre Norman? I'm trying to digitize my business. So courses, trainings, all that type of stuff. Because once that's done, then I can physically go help more people. So I'm stuck having to go to work. Mm. Even though my work is cool, I go to Genius, and I go to War Room, and I go to stuff scaling up. I go to great places, but it still takes time. And if I didn't have, if I could digitize myself, mm-hmm. and that money it makes while I'm sleeping, and I could physically show up for the mom in Sarasota or the mom in Maine or the mom in Vegas, I got six people who asked me to come help their kids the other day. When I went to San Fran, six moms came crying. I can't go because I got to work. So I got to schedule them in mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. just being able to just go. I want to be able to just go. How do you choose then if, if there are six moms and they're all over the world? How They're all over the country, ideally. They're all in America. But how do, how do you choose? It's just when I'm free because now I look at my schedule. When am I free? And I try to schedule what part of the country they're in. Where can I get to first, second, and third? I'm going to get to all six. But instead of just being able to walk out of that conference mm. and fly straight to San Diego, because I'm already in San Francisco, I'd have loved to just fly straight to San Diego. It was like mm. a 45-minute flight. But I got to, had to come back east because I got stuff I have to do for work. Then mm-hmm. I had to, now I'm sitting here. I'm looking at my calendar. I'm like, okay, I'm scheduling people's lives around a meeting, around appointments, and around speeches. I don't want to do that stuff. So yeah. when I can digitize my life or just find some great sponsor that says, Dre, here, just go live your dream, then I could just, I left that conference, went straight to San Diego and saved us up. 
All right. So I'll call you Dre now. I'll call you Dre. So here's a tough question for you. Or maybe this not. A, this is a closing tough question. I, I'm, I'm eight minutes late. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, quick, quick Ask question. Me. How, when you're digitized, and I understand the value of that, serving many, right? But how does that replicate you joining? I think I'm answering my question as I'm asking it. How, how is that replicating you joining with them so they feel you're with them? No, 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 no. I'm not going to digitize my outreach, but I can create a course on being a motivational speaker or on the corporate oh. stuff. Not my outreach. I, I want to digitize the other stuff, create a course, create a list or whatever, so I can then physically go do the outreach. Got it. Got it. All right. Okay. So um, last question on my end. What's the last book you reread? Who Not How by Ben, ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan. Okay, and and you read you reread that because why? It works. <laughs> it, it's just listen. I believe there's a guy in 100K who I believe the book is based on because he went from 350 thousand annual to some ungodly like 150 million annual, 200 million annual, and it was kind of based on who not how. And the book. Ooh, you, you're gonna have to tell me offline who that was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I was sitting in the room and they were talking about it and. He, to me, not, they didn't say, but I'm like, he was there with Ben for like, I mean, with um, Dan and strategic coach for years. And I'm like, he took who, not how to from 350,000 to like 150 million using the principles. So I'm like, he's the test case and it okay. tested well. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me just fill the listeners in. So Dre is talking about Dan Sullivan, the founder of strategic coach, the, I wouldn't even say arguably, inarguably the number one entrepreneurial coach in the world. I've had the privilege to have conversations with him. If you ever have the privilege to be in the same room with him, I highly suggest keep your mouth shut and your ears open. And Dr. Benjamin Hardy is absolutely a thought leader on who, not how, and how to be your, He's coming out with a new book too now, right? Be Your Future Self Now. Two brilliant, brilliant people that Dre and I absolutely have the pleasure of sitting in the same room with. So Dre, how may yes. people find out more about you? Where Let's go to our website, AndreNorman.com. AndreNorman.com, that's it. All right, so thank you so much for your time. And that concludes today's podcast episode of The Trust Doctor, Restoring Trust and Enriching Significant Relationships. And as I promised, Andre Norman took us for an incredible, unbelievable ride. So make sure before you leave, you like, comment, share, and subscribe to today's podcast. Thank you so much, Andre. And until next time, be well. Once again, we've concluded another great episode of The Trust Doctor with Dr. Patty Ann. Tune in next week for more insights and advice on how you can create, nurture, and sustain healthy relationships. To find out more about the podcast, visit drpattyann.com forward slash podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share. Until next time.